This episode of Serverless Chats is sponsored by Lamigo. This week, Rebecca and I chat with Farrah Campbell about serverless community building. This is Serverless Chats, episode number 134. Hey everyone, I'm Rebecca Marshburn. And I'm Jeremy Daly. And you are listening to Serverless Chats. Jeremy, I am curious if you have any stories about when the third time has been the charm. When the third time has been the charm? Oh, uh, I don't know. Because I think this third time as the first and the second, but this third time will also be the charm with our very special guest. Do you want to introduce her? Yes, yeah, so um, so this guest is entering the third timers club. So this is a new thing we're doing on serverless chats. Not really. I'm making it up right now. But it's just like the five timers club on Saturday Night Live. We have the third timers club for uh, serverless chats. This is an amazing guest. I'm so happy to have her here. She is the senior product marketing manager for modern applications at AWS, Farah Campbell. Hey, Farah, thank you so much for joining us again and again. Again and again and again. Can be like, woohoo, <laughs> made it to the third timers club. Anyway, no, it's always fun to chat with you. I mean, it's, you know, I feel like I've known you guys forever now and that we've been working so c closely just now in like different ways, you know, in the last few years. So it's been uh, it's great to be back uh, now that I'm, you know, at AWS doing s similar things to what Rebecca was doing. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, so we, so we met, I think, well, well before, uh, you know, you were at Stackery and, um, uh, and we connected on a few different things. And then of course, Rebecca, you know, with the heroes program and I was a hero, you were a hero, we were all heroes, which was awesome. And anyways, but so now what are you doing at AWS specifically? So I'm the senior product marketing manager for containers and serverless, but my focus is really on, you know, and, you know, engagement and advocacy. So, uh, you know, I kind of consider myself, you know, well, I, I manage the, the hero program for container serverless, but also the, the new community builder program, which is awesome, uh, for containers and serverless. And I kind of see myself as a, you know, a bridge, you know, somebody that helps to, you know, collect feedback from, you know, our communities and then make sure that they get to the right people. Uh, and you could only imagine, you know, uh, how much coverage that is across those two services or those two categories. So will you tell us a little bit more about the different levels of those community programs? So there's the AWS Heroes and the AWS Community Builders. I know there are worldwide user groups, but I think you're focused primarily on the first two. And I think a lot of times, I mean, they're both really excellent programs, but they definitely um invite different like levels of experience right or people who are maybe at a different point in their journeys along being guides mentors content creators etc so will you tell us a little bit about the distinctions of those programs sure so you know for the heroes you know we only have i think we have 230 of them you know or yeah i think it's 230 now around the world and that program is you know different because it's it's i would it's you can't opt in. So for the community builders program, you can, you know, register or apply for it. And uh, for the heroes program, that's not something that you can apply for externally. It's, you know, it's all done internally. So I would say our heroes uh, also help to enable community builders. There's also, you know, both of them act as user group leaders. You know, both of them are, you know, working to help communities, you know, learn more about building on top of AWS. Uh, but I say like the clear distinction is, you know, Heroes is more of a, um, it's, you know, it's more of a our VIP group, you know, and it's something that, uh, well, something that you can't apply for. So. Yeah. So the, the Heroes program, again, it, it's great. I, I mean, going out to reinvent and, you know, this is one of the things we we're talking about, like, you know, there's a, there's this huge dinner and then usually Werner shows up for, I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing. And then, um, you know, access to early, you know, sort of, uh, to, to have the ability to comment on things or to kind of see things uh, as they're being built um, and give some early feedback and, and talk about how it impacts the things that we're doing and stuff like that. You know, there's a there's a couple of examples, um, you know, just where like just feedback from heroes helped shape the product better, which is just amazing. And so I want to talk about community builders too, because that's sort of a relatively new program. And, and I think that's super cool. But just quickly on the heroes thing, like what are, you know, just if anybody's out there, because I've had people ask me too, they're like, how do 
don't become a hero. And uh, I said, we just got to get a cape. And that's pretty much all you need. But seriously, though, like, what are the what are the qualities that you look for in heroes? And what are the things that, you know, you know, that 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 uh, sort of make people stand out, uh, you know, at least in the in, in your eyes and AWS, you know, when choosing those people? I mean, I can speak for myself. I can't speak for the, you know, there's other reviewers, there's, there's multiple steps, you know, along the way, but, you know, for me, uh, you know, I think, you know, for people that are really out there just working to enable communities, it's not for the, their job. It's not for, you know, uh, like a group that they're involved in, you know, that, um, but it's really, you know, somebody that's taking the time working to understand, you know, what problems peace or pe what problems people are facing. And then taking the time to try to address those. And so, you know, they're, um, you know, out there running user groups, maybe, you know, smaller events. Uh, they write a lot of content, maybe developing white papers, uh, a lot of, you know, contributions to OSS, uh, you know, that are maintaining projects that, you know, are uh, really, um, well, really valued by the communities because they solve problems that, you know, AWS hasn't solved. Uh, so. Uh, I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's for people that, um, it can't be self-serving, you know, that that's, I think that's really what makes a hero. It's, it's, it's somebody that's out there, you know, giving to others and that's the primary goal. Yeah. So that's like the, you know, philosophically, let's talk tactically for a moment. And I know that you, I, I only want to ask you to speak for yourself, but there are so many dimensions of which you're starting to look at, like who might, you know, internally who might quote unquote qualify as a hero at this point in their journey. And it's, it's wild, right? You have, or when I was there, right, I had what we call a spreadsheet of doom where you have, you know, all these names on the left and all these columns along the top. And you're like, what do they do on GitHub? What do they do on Stack Overflow? Um, do they have a personal blog? What have their talks been on YouTube? Are they presenting at places? Are they going to meetups? Are they a user group leader? And then you have all these sort of like, yes, no, yes, no. And then you know, tech, like technically how sound and clean their code is, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have like technical reviewers and all these things, sorts of things too. Is that still what your process looks like? Uh, for me, I guess, in, in, so I now work, I, as you know, at this startup called Common Room, which is all about like enabling the community leaders to be able to let go of their spreadsheet of doom and like surface those insights. It's like legitimately why I left. I was like, this is such a hard problem to tackle as a community leader. And like, then this company was building this platform to do that. Is that still how you're doing it as well? Like a very manual sort of like spreadsheet of doom, a bunch of columns and rows, or have you, and I hope you have found like a, an easier, maybe simpler, cleaner way for you to be able to track who these wonderful people are across the globe that are contributing to the community. Uh, I, <laughs> I wish we had something more than a uh, uh, than the, the spreadsheet, uh, but um, you know, hopefully at some point we'll be able to use Common Room and have our prob that my problem solved. So I don't know how much I can talk about this step, but what I can say is that you know it is very important right now for us to find people that are in underrepresented markets, underrepresented. Um, uh, what well, needs to be more inclusive, let's just say that. Uh, and so trying to find uh, ways to help others that want to get involved. I really think the community builders program has been great for that. Uh, and um, it's actually really refreshing to see this new like energy coming in and because everybody is so excited. And for me, just like actually watching the serverless, you know, everybody coming in from like the serverless that, you know, um, community that I already knew. Uh, and these are people from all around the world. Like we have our first serverless hero in, uh, you know, South Africa. Uh, and he's uh, hanging out now with Feliciwa, who used to be an AWS hero, who was actually, you know, working to uh, bring or working to help more customers understand how to build with AWS. Uh, so I think it's really important to keep finding ways uh, to, you know, find regions and people that we can help. I just um, am sort of uh, stunned to find out that there was a technical code review because I don't know how I made it through that. So somebody really screwed up on your team at the time, Rebecca. I let the cat out of the bag. Actually, I was reviewing your code. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that makes me feel No, bad. I was not reviewing your code. That is not true. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> That would be that would be a myth. That would be very misleading if I was actually saying I was. That's a joke, everyone. I was not reviewing Jeremy's code. I promise. <laughs> um, fair. I think something as well that's really indicative of of AWS and your programs really extending embracing globality, right? Is and in inclusivity is 
there's also scholarship programs to reinvent, I believe, especially for people from those underrepresented groups or underrepresented backgrounds or countries that don't normally get as much as um, as much focus, let's say, or maybe are known for quote unquote, like, you know, being developer rich, um, which is which is not true. Um, and so I love that AWS is that you all are spearheading these types of programs. Is there anything that you can share about those scholarships to reinvent or those types of programs you're trying to bring those people into the fold that might normally not get the attention that they deserve? Yeah, I think last year, and I can't remember the exact number, but I actually got to meet one of our uh, community builders and they do get like a discount uh, to be able to attend re reInvent, um, you know, heroes, uh, they get to come to it for free. Um, but um, there was a program, one of the community builders, she applied for the diversity scholarship and got to attend reInvent and had money to cover the whole thing. She had money to cover food because like, that's one thing that you just don't anticipate is how expensive everything is yeah. there. So In I really Vegas. thought, yeah. you know, like <laughs> you get a burger and a beer and it's $50, you know, right. yeah. guess what? You, you opt out for the French fries because that's an additional <laughs> cost. That's kind of what I remember about it. But yeah, it's really I, I actually kind of awesome to get to meet some of our community builders through those programs. And it just, you know, kind of helps you to understand how important they are. Yeah, and, and the community builders program. So can you because um, uh, that that is more of an open that's something you can opt into. Right. And get accepted into. And, and I and I see all all the time, you know, announcing new community builders and so forth. Just a quick overview of that program again and, and what people need to do to, to be part of that. And what I guess what some of the benefits are of, of being part of that program. Yeah, sure. So some of the benefits would be that, you know, you're getting to connect with other AWS enthusiasts from all around the world. And, you know, you know that, you know, what that power of connection can be. I mean, you know, being able to collaborate with Alex Debris that you've met through this program, you know, like with Jan and like, you know, a lot of us has been doing this, uh, like I said, the hero program is specifically, you know, we've seen a lot of really good connections and now we're starting to see that in the community builders. And I just think like having having the opportunity to ask questions in, uh, you know, in a group where you have different people with different types of experiences, you know, working at different companies. And, you know, as we all know, we're, everybody's learning how to build these architectures, right. And to develop a more modern application strategy. And so just being able to get feedback, you know, from a thousand people from around the world is, you know, pretty powerful. You know, other benefits that are, you know, being able to, you know, get connected to service teams, you know, by reaching out to, you know, community leads like me. Um, they also get to join. Sometimes we can, uh, you know, get to do, you know, early briefings or to be involved in projects that where we're looking for early feedback, um, which is nice. Um, uh, you get to get a credit for uh, things for certificates, you know, to take some of our um, courses. Uh, you also get, what else do they get? You get credits for just AWS credits to keep building. Uh, there's all kinds of benefits, but I would really say like the one that I see, the one what, the one that makes me most excited is seeing how people are connecting from all around the world and then self-organizing to, you know, create projects to help enable more communities. Uh, you know, currently with the serverless community builders, you know, we have a serverless community builders project where a number of them have come together and meeting monthly and they have, you know, uh, have this whole like GitHub org where we're tracking projects that they want to work on. There may be content that they want to write. Uh, and more like themes that like I can take back to the service teams of issues that they're running into. And just, you know, watching all that happen is, uh, I don't know, it just makes me want to help them even more. So let's talk about organizing. Um, we often get to this topic, you know, at the end of the show, maybe we're like, okay, tell us about your technical things and what you're serving application wise and the services you're using or, but this is so integral to your job and mission. So. Let's dive into it right now. You've cultivated the serverless community as an organizer of so many things, right? Portland Serverless Days, the Portland Serverless Meetup, numerous super serverless workshops, the Portland tech community events from TechFest, multiple luminaries coming to Portland. And that's just what you've done in your own hometown. You also support communities across the globe. You travel to speak and meet them all over the country. You enable people to self-organize through the Builders Program and the Heroes Program. And you do this in such a way where it seems like the logistics just quote unquote fall away and everything happens organically. But the trick to that is the community being together feels simple, but it's actually so hard to do. It's a whole slew of planning and thinking and spreadsheets and logistics and calls and questions and answers that enable it to happen. And I think 
a lot of folks are trying to figure out how do they also either run an in-person event or a digital event or have a programmatic series of events? How do they bring people together? Um, and so I'm wondering if you can share some of your best practices for first bringing the community together digitally or what's really helped people self-organized or what they've needed in their, you know, quote unquote, organization kit. Um, and then we can talk about tips for bringing together people in person, which are also great at. But let's start digitally since that's kind of where we've been in the world recently. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'd say, you know, just like getting to know people first. So I, you know, I take the time, you know, with all the new community builders, you know, we have a welcome call uh, and I, you know, I tell them things that I want to help them with, or here's certain things that I've helped other community builders with, you know, so please reach out. So I feel like, you know, starting to gather feedback first and just helping them to understand that you are engaged and are there and are listening. Um, you know, I make sure to respond to Slack messages in our group, uh, that I, you know, uh, um, I don't know that I'm, I'm recognizing all that, that all of the work that they're doing. And I think that's really, uh, an important piece is to be present. Right. And it's, it's not just about, uh, you know, I guess following along in the conversations, but also participating. Right. Uh, and then what I do is I gather a lot of notes and try to keep track of them somehow in the 50 different places that I keep them. And, <laughs> and so at one point I'm going to have to streamline that, but it is in about 50 different places right now. Uh, but I still like know where they're all at, which is awesome. Um, and then I would say I've been really, really lucky to be able to uh, work with the service teams the way I have because of, I'd say, like the relationship that I had with folks when I was at Stackery. And so, you know, developing the right relationships, you know, making sure you're bringing information and themes so I can get the service teams connected. Because at the end of the day, I mean, the community builders and the heroes, they're there because they care about a specific service, you know, an AWS product. Something has simplified their lives in building and they want to know more about it uh, so they can help, you know, teach others and enable other people to, you know, find the same wins. And so um, making sure I can help get our service teams engaged, you know, I run a lot of, uh, I run a lot of webinars, uh, you know, with our service teams, uh, with the DA teams, really with anybody I can find that will do them. And I try to, you know, do them. Uh, you know, morning and evening, just so we can capture our global audience. Uh, so I'd say like, those are some of the things that I've done digitally to, you know, activate the community and, you know, to help them start self-organized because, you know, when we're feeding them information, I feel like that helps to give them information on things that they want to do. Uh, and then, um, you know, making sure that I'm taking back all the work that they're doing and, you know, plugging it back to the service team. So it's recognized on, you know, the AWS side, because I think that, you know, feels really good for them. Oh my gosh, I totally know your experience about writing notes everywhere. The big joke is <laughs> that when I really need to do something, I will write a note on my hand because I know that I'm going to wash my hand. So I have to do it very quickly. And that's like, you know, that it's go time if Rebecca writes a note on her hand. So you've also brought together people in person recently. And I think Jeremy has a question he wanted to ask you about this. Yeah, I was, I was going to also make the comment that, um, you know, every time I, um, I think every time Farah and I ever met in person, it was because we were either speaking at the same conference <laughs> or it was reinvent or something like that. So um, I feel like I've never, I don't know if I've ever seen you in Portland. I think I've only seen you in Belfast and then, you know, uh, where else were we together? Uh, Cardiff and, and uh, Boston and some of these other places. So anyways, um, always wonderful to see people in person. And that's a crazy thing where, um, the, the pandemic has been, you know, a tragedy on so many levels. And, and the, one of the biggest things for me, and this is, I think doing this podcast has kept me sane because I've been able to talk to people, which we just really haven't been able to do in person, um, you know, for the longest time. And before the pandemic hit, um, you know, these conferences, especially the serverless days conferences and even reinvent, and it was great to get some people back at reinvent. It was a little bit different, you know, the masks and all that kind of stuff, whatever, but just getting people in person, going and sitting down with them and having a coffee or having a beer or going out to dinner or the parties that they do. It's just such a, 
it's electric. It's such a different sort of feeling to be in the same room. And I know when I go to some of these conferences, I barely ever listen to the talks because I just want to hang out in the hallway and talk to people. Um, but so, yeah, so you've you've done a bunch of these. You and I did one together at reInvent. We did the Serverless for Everyone thing, which was uh, so much fun, which would be great to do that again, you know, in, in the future. But so it, just in terms of bringing people together in person, um, logistically, uh, you know, it, in the past, it was hard, you know, it's probably even harder now. But um, logistically, like, what are some of those tips? Like, if you were going to do that, I know serverless days, New York is, is going to have an in person one serverless days, Paris is having an in person uh, event. Obviously, reinvent was, uh, you know, that's a massive undertaking. But if you're a smaller community doing meetups, things like that, um, what are some of those tips to to sort of work that out logistically? Oh, man. Uh, well, uh, this is a big question. It depends on what kind of event we're running. I mean, are we doing the containers and serverless zone? Because that's a whole lot more than, you know, like the networking lounge that, you know, we had. Right. Um, uh, well, let's, start, I, let's start with the let's start with the maybe, you know, the the local meetup, maybe progressing to a small conference or something like that. So, like, I mean, I feel like you. Uh, I always start with trying to find like an exciting speaker, <laughs> you know, something, somebody that kind of gets people excited and, uh, and then, um, I make sure that there's snacks and, and there's food and That's drinks. But when call. you do that, I know yeah. there has to be snacks and there has to be some sort of food, but it also has to be, you know, you have to have food, you know, to cover people's dietary needs. And so I'm very, very aware of that. And I also make sure because like we have beer, alcohol. I don't want it to feel heavy and that other folks will always go make sure I find like some special fancy sodas, something that's not like the Sprite or Diet Coke, but it's, you know, something that's, you know, more like a beer, like, you know, um, I've even gotten no duels to have there. So I feel like, you know, when people feel like, you know, you've got, you've thought about them, you know, when they show up and there's, uh, there's, I don't know, there's something for everyone and you don't feel like, well, you walk in and I remember being at some events, you're like, obviously, like, I can't eat any of this because this, you know, I'm not eating dairy right now or whatever it is. So I think making sure that you have the right things to help, you know, people, um, well, to not that the right things to, uh, make sure everyone is comfortable. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'd say making sure women are comfortable at these events. I like to have name tags, you know, for, uh, just to have more representation. So making sure people have can make, maybe if they want to be talked to right now, I would say in COVID, how close so you can kind of, like, I think at uh, KubeCon, I saw like one was like a uh, green meant that you could like come up and give them a hug. Uh, a blue meant like they were cool with a, like a fist bump, you know, but please. And then like a red was like, Hey, like, I'm please don't, you know, I don't want to have anybody like reach out and hug me. And I thought that was really cool. So doing things like that, just to make sure that people are feel comfortable. Always have to think about having good uh, internet so people can uh, get on. I remember, I don't know if you guys all remember Serverless Days Portland, but uh, it was a great event, but we did that. I did not have um, Wi-Fi. I didn't realize that I needed to get that for the building that I was using. <laughs> and so I had like Kelsey Hightower was doing a live demo and we weren't able to get online and it was just, you know, um, so. I mean, well, that's why I don't do live demos in a conference talk. It's just, uh, and that's just conference speaking 101. It's all recorded and then you just pretend it's live. But then I think there's also has to be a space where people aren't selling to them. You know, there has to be a space for people to kind of right. come together and just engage. And, you know, I think we did like, like we did the serverless for everyone, you know, party and, you know, we're asking for people to sponsor. And so there's a lot of companies and, you know, they want to show off who they are and, you know, we're, we're telling them, no, that's not what this event is for, you know, to ask people to go to your booth or give them your card and set up a meeting for tomorrow. But, you know, this space here is for people to get to know one another. Um, and I think, you know, make, we made sure we had the right people. We're inviting other leaders from, you know, across different categories, different teams, different services. Um, and, you know, I think that really is what makes an event, you know, awesome is when, you have different people that can come together to you know, solve, you know, hard problems or just to connect, you know, in ways and be like, hey, I, I remember you from Twitter or I've seen your name on Twitter. Hi, everyone. I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Lumigo. Gain full visibility into Lambda invocation flows quickly with Lumigo, the cloud monitoring and troubleshooting platform that helps developers like you see the whole story end to end. Resolve critical issues in serverless and distributed environments, giving you better insights into your Lambda's mind. Start free today at Lumigo.io. 
I think, too, talking about, well, first, I want to compliment you both on the serverless for everyone party. I got to be an attendee and I loved it a lot. Uh, it's still one of my highlights years later. Um, talking about space, uh, Fair, I think you did this really well in the serverless and container zone at reInvent um, just a few months ago. But it's also like to really clearly call out if you want people to hang around somewhere, you have to give them either a place to lean or a place to sit. And you definitely did that, right? There is like a few tables, there are some chairs, there are some sort of like high tables or high, I don't know what you would call that, banister-ish things, if you will, where people can lean. Um, and it seems so silly to say out loud, but if you don't offer that, then people will end up just kind of standing and feeling like, well, I guess I'll go because you can't find that place of comfort. Um, and so I thought what you did so well with the space that you had at the serverless container zone is you had a couple focal points so that was like, you know, DDR machines and then like a little stage where something was happening. And then you also gave people the chance to be an audience where they could also relax in the audience. So they had a few places to sit or they could lean. And so when they were talking, it didn't feel like they had to move through. It felt like they could kind of stick around. And I think that's really important whether or not you're at a small meetup or, you know, a larger conference or a space in the middle where if you want people to stick around to talk, you have to give them a way to be comfortable while they do that. And I think you nailed that at the booth last year. Ah, well, thank you. Yeah, no, that was very deliberate. I wanted places for people to hang out and sit. They needed to have charging uh, stations. I wanted the tabletops to be whiteboards. So people like if they were there talking, they would have a space to be able to like write and share. Uh, so that was like on the, you know, the tables where people could sit, but also on the, the, the I can't remember what they're called, the standing tables, <laughs> the, the high top yeah. tables. Um, but you know, that, that was also pretty, I thought that was awesome. Just kind of like watching our team, uh, you know, sit there and be like whiteboarding with, you know, customers, uh, was, uh, you know, you knew that was kind of a win and, um, but yeah, and then having food and drinks. So we had, you know, having like different things, coffee and, you know, teas and, uh, no champagne, uh, apparently that was a big, oh no, no. <laughs> my bad. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, I tell you. Anywhere you can go to watch two grown men, one dressed up as a squirrel and the other one dressed up as an otter, uh, doing Dance Dance Revolution. Um, I mean, if that's not the place to hang out, I, I don't know. I don't know what is. So, um, anyway, that, so, that sorry, was actually that was actually awesome. That's the other thing is you have to have things for people to do. So, like, there needs to be engaging activities. And so, you know, I had the claw machine, and then I had right. the, the DDR machine. Uh, and I just, you know, try to find a way to like keep it fun and, you know, something that, you know, that audience would want, might want to do. So, yeah, no, it was it was great. Now, one of the things about this um, serverless and container zone is that you brought serverless and containers together. There's all kinds of jokes, right, about oh, serverless versus containers and the whole thing. Um, so I'm just curious, um, you know, bringing those people together. Obviously, it's not binary anymore with Fargate and all these other things. And of course, people are building applications that are using Lambda and EventBridge and all this kind of stuff. But they're also still using Kubernetes and other services that that maybe aren't, um, you know, so much serverless. And and again, just people are building really interesting modern apps using all of these different services now. So I'm just curious, um, you know, when you sort of when you sort of bring these people together now because it didn't really i think when it first started it kind of wasn't that way it was almost like containers went into a separate room and then the serverless people went into a separate separate room i remember at the that developer uh, advocate or the developer influence conference it was like container people went here and serverless people went there um and now it seems that these things are merging together so i'm just curious what your <laughs> um your impression of that is maybe or um just sort of the the new thinking around this well, uh, so the containers and serverless zone was my idea, um, and I think uh, I think it's kind of silly to separate the two. Uh, I I don't, you know, a lot of our serverless heroes are actually, you know, working on Kubernetes projects as well, and a lot of our container heroes uh, are very well versed in Lambda, uh, and so it, it, I don't think it's an either or, and so. Um, my boss at the time basically said like we were trying to figure out different things that we could do and i threw out that maybe we could do containers at serverless zone and actually have you know uh our da's and engineers and uh you know pms from across both orgs you know uh be at one place for customers to come to and um that's kind of i'll be honest uh when I first was asking a few other people about if it was going to work everybody kept telling me it wasn't <laughs> and I was like well I think it's a good idea so 
uh, my, my boss, Scott, approved it, and uh, away I went. And I'm, I'm actually really glad to see how it worked out. I thought it was really, really awesome to hear how people were saying, like, they felt better about it, not feeling like an or, like, having it, you know, be versus. It felt good to have, you know, both people, um, you know, uh, have it to be one conversation. It was really fun to, like, watch customers be talking about, you know, with one of our DAs about, uh, you know, ECS or EKS, but then want to you know get into more of like, hey, now they want to understand more about microservices and you know what's that approach going to look like, and then being able to reach over to a coworker and say, hey, this is what we're looking for now. I mean, that was pretty awesome. So I'm hoping to do more of those uh, in the future. And and I was perfectly happy to take both a Lambda and a Fargate koozie. So you can sign me up for that. <laughs> He's got a drink in each hand, you know, left hand Lambda, right hand Fargate. So it's in your name, right? Modern applications. You're not just a PMM for serverless or PMM for containers. And and I love that you are leading the community from this like higher level umbrella term in terms of like the ultimate goal is to build these applications that serve the company better, that, you know, abstract all this away, all this heavy, undifferentiated heavy lifting, as you would say, at AWS, that make it easier for the developer to focus on what matters most to their business. Um, and so I'm imagining that you've seen some of these walls come down between that binary serverless or containers, but I also imagine that you've seen some really spirited conversations. And I'm wondering if you can highlight a few of those and maybe what some of the foundational and um, philosophical differences are, right? Where those spirited conversations come into play um, or times where you've seen people like it, you know, really amped and jazzed about something and then at the end you know be like actually i could see how you built it that way and um, so i wonder if there are any that kind of stick out to you in terms of topical conversation moments when you've seen these two serverless and containers come together i honestly haven't seen any of that since being at aws it was more just about how my approach was but really i i haven't seen any of that at aws i actually feel like it's uh when their conversations are together uh, I would, yeah, which is, I think is probably pretty rare, uh, you know, um, on the stuff that we're working on, right? We have, you know, folks that are doing work with serverless. We have folks that are doing things in, uh, over on the container side. So I honestly haven't really seen any of that, like at AWS, um, but I have seen it. <laughs> I have seen it at events and things. Um, I think, you know, I think it's more of just a misunderstanding of what it actually can enable. I think some people, I think containers folks at, at first were a little bit um, apprehensive because, you know, Lambda promised all these things and, you know, this is the new way and it was going to be easy and fast and it, you know, wasn't easy. Uh, and there's a lot of things to figure out. And so I think that there was a lot of apprehension on that side. But I have, like, it has been fun to kind of see the conversation evolve. Uh, many of the, you know, when I'm doing things like with our briefings and things, I try to just include all of them uh, instead of, so I'm not having to do, you know, here's a briefing for you guys, here's a briefing for you guys, and to try to bring, you know, both folks together. Uh, it has been really, really interesting to see um, just the amount of like containers folks that want to join uh, the, the the serverless conversations and just how many of them are using it. You know, I actually kind of thought they Maybe they didn't, but a, a lot of them are very, very heavy to Lambda users. And um, uh, I would say like lot less apprehensive than, than than they used to be. Yeah. And I think I think that is something interesting, too, just with, you know, having these different briefings. It's sort of like it's interesting to think of what services certain people are interested in. Right. So just because, you know, I, I you know I use Lambda quite a bit doesn't mean I don't want to know about Fargate or something to do with RDS or, you know, something else that's happening because those are important things that, you know, make up the bulk of the the applications that that I work on. Um, so having access and just kind of bringing all those people together, I think is, uh, I think it's super important. And again, if you're using containers, you might be orchestrating certain things with step functions, for example, right? Or using DynamoDB as a storage mechanism and all, there's so much overlap there. You know, I think that that, uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, and in, in, in the thing that's great about those briefings, and I mentioned this earlier, was, you know, heroes or, or community builders that, that can uh, get involved with some of the different briefings that you do, 
you get that feedback, right? The product teams get that feedback. And oftentimes the product is pretty well, you know, it's almost there, right? It's just sort of wrapping up the last few things, trying to kind of lock down some stuff and just get some feedback on where it is. Sometimes you get much earlier. I know I've been asked a couple of times to review proposals that were like really, really early. And like that is just... I, it's it's like very flattering to be asked those things just to be able to get in early. But I'm curious if um you know if, if you have any examples or maybe just generally you know product direction or things like that that have that have changed or even thinking internally for some of these product teams that might have changed because they benefit from this early feedback from from heroes and from community builders. Oh, definitely. Um, you know, we just did a, uh, we just had a, a, a briefing with heroes where we were gathering feedback, um, on the roadmap, uh, for both even, uh, for both event bridge and step functions. And from those calls, you know, I think there was uh, eight meetings set up with different heroes, you know, just to do some follow up. So they're definitely, it does affect, you know, how things are built. Uh, it does affect how, you know, we, it can affect how we talk about it. And I just think that I'm a really huge advocate, obviously, to get all of you in front of, you know, as many service teams as possible, just because like, I understand the depth of knowledge that everybody, you know, has just, you know, kind of being part of that community and also like understanding what we know is important to all of you. Um, but I feel like y y you are looking at this in a much different way, right? You're working with, you know, your own communities and, and, and broader, you know, and, and broader, your broader ecosystem, I guess. And uh, you know, working with many of you and you know, like doing a lot of different consultants, maybe, maybe you're working at companies. So like you have a lot of information about how customers are utilizing AWS. And so, uh, it is highly valuable to get that feedback. Um, and I uh, have recently did doing surveys where I'm asking the PMs, like, what did they get out of that? You know, on a scale of one to 10, uh, and every time it's been a 10. So, uh, you know, really that, um, I would say. I don't know have any examples of uh, an exact product oh i do have like that there was a um the es builds that was just launched from the oss team actually goiko mm. is the one that actually uh, sent us information on that so that's actually something um but it does affect the it does a lot i mean your guys's feedback does uh definitely help product direction uh go to market messaging um across a number of our different services Something that I loved so much or that I still love so much, right, is I, I always like to say that heroes and community builders and, I mean, customers in general who are willing to share the gift of feedback, uh, but they're not only our biggest advocates and biggest external teachers, like they ex expand the scale of what just, you know, internal employees can do in terms of education and reaching people and connecting and teaching, um, but they're also our harshest critics in, in a way that is like raising the bar to make things better. Um, and in that way, right, there's, uh, they're, they're, I would say critiquers maybe is a nicer way to say it than critics. Um, and through that, right, they, they have extremely well-formed ideas that they've been thinking about for a really long time across a really big depth of experience. And then sometimes they come together to put those well-thought forms and ideas into a book or a long sort of like, you know, series of blog posts or Twitch series or teaching series or series of presentations. Um, so I'm wondering if there's anyone whose work that you'd specifically like to highlight that's been leading the community recently or any exciting um, news from the community since they, they touch so many folks. They do touch so many folks. Well, I'd say one of the most recently, or the, the most recent is um, Yang Kui and Peter Sparsky with the help of Ajay. Um, just released their uh, second uh, version of their serverless architectures on AWS. So I uh, highly recommend getting that book. I think it's awesome that they've taken the time to update it because, you know, we know there's been a lot of changes and they, since the first one. So, you know, really going back to it to ensure that that content is correct, I just think is was really awesome. And um, uh, I appreciate it. I mean, I, and I think that's kind of one of the things that, you know, we see in Heroes, right, is they do think through, uh, you know, the, you know, what they're giving to the community and making sure to go back and update it. So those resources are still valuable because getting set up on something when uh, maybe the updates change could actually kind of put you in a bad place or you might be, you know, doing workarounds that you didn't need. So um, that's one I'd like to highlight. Um, trying to think of other ones. 
there's so much work that everybody's doing. Uh, it, I feel like it's consistent. I know Slobodan and um, Alexander and Goiko are getting ready to release another book. Um, they've already done one, but I think their new one is like r running serverless applications um, with GraphQL and AppSync. Uh, I think that one's coming out uh, in the next few months. So definitely watch for that. I'm still trying to figure out how they have time to, you know, write all Seriously. these books. I have, I just like, with the amount of work that everybody has to do and having your job and then, uh, you know, having a life and a family, but then like also like writing a book <laughs> just seems like a lot. I had to stop trying to figure that out because honestly, it made my head sort of explode. I was like, it is, I mean, you got Jeremy over here making animations, you got Forrest making raps on a piano, you got people writing books, you got people, I was just like, just take a breath and celebrate their work because it's a wild, it's a wild time out there. It's really, really, truly impressive. Not just that, like the camera's already set up perfectly, you know, like great <laughs> light, you know, great mic, like just all of it. You know, they have like all the different buttons so they can like work through everything. I mean, it just, yeah. Dial. Very impressive. Dial. All way, all, it's like imposter syndrome central. <laughs> well, it is a lot of work. Um, I mean, I can attest. Uh, it's been a lot of time crafting content and so forth. And the funniest thing for me, especially when I write blog posts, is like I write a blog post and it's done. And then I'm like, all right, but now I still have the whole process of I got to figure out some sort of image to use for it. I've got to think about the SEO. I've got to schedule it. I've got to write a, you know, a clever tweet for it. Like it goes well beyond just the content creation piece as well. So um, it does get uh, it is a lot of work, but it is the other thing, though. And, and I will say this just as somebody who who has created a lot of content and it has gotten a lot of positive feedback, probably more than I than I certainly deserve. But I've gotten so much amazing feedback of people who are like, the things that you've done or this particular blog post or this video or whatever it was that you did or this open source project, um, like this helped me so much. Like this got me over this hump or it inspired me or whatever. Um, and, I, and I know I talk to so many people who do content creation and other things, and that is the most rewarding thing because it really is about helping other people, right? And just finding a way to connect, sharing what you know. And again, I get so much benefit from just writing down the things that I learn and sharing it with other people because it helps me sort of, you know, figure out what exactly my stance is or how I think about a certain thing. So, um, yeah, that's it, it's absolutely amazing. And um, and so, again, it's it's you know, it's not self-serving, but it is pretty rewarding work. Yeah. And don't like don't sell yourself short. Like you produce a ton of amazing content. And like I remember like working on some of those reference architectures with you and you've been going back to those. So Jeremy, I, yeah, you've done a lot of work that I know is important to a lot of people, uh, including us, like when I was at Stackery. So I second well, Sarah's motion. Appreciate that. Don't sell yourself <laughs> short. Celebrate yourself. Yeah. Treat yourself. So I, since I, I want to throw the tables, well, I want to turn the tables, Jeremy, and just ask sure. you. So like, what's your favorite part about being, uh, you know, involved with the AWS, uh, being an AWS hero? Ooh, great question. I, that is a great question. I didn't know I was going to be on the other <laughs> side of the mic here. Um, So... <laughs> Uh, I tell you, the biggest thing I love is meeting people. I mean, the connections, like you said, that was the thing. Um, I have people now that I know because of, you know, AWS communities um, and the Heroes program that I would probably consider some of my really good friends now. Um, you know what I mean? I talk to them all the time. We are always exchanging messages whenever we are at those conferences. Those are the people that I, you know, go find first to make sure that we can go grab a beer. Um, you know, Farry, you're included in that list of people. Uh, certainly Rebecca's included in that list of people and so many others. Um, so it's just great to have that. But then also the thing that was, was really great about the Heroes thing is we're talking about new stuff, at least in the serverless, you know, or we've been, it's not as new, but there's a lot of new stuff coming out. The thing that has been really nice about, um, you know, sort of having that, um, that hero uh, sort of associated with your name is the fact that um, not only do you get early access to some of the things and you get to talk to, you know, that the product managers are always interested in talking to heroes about the things that, you know, we're interested in, what our use cases are. Um, you know, I've said things before, like, you know, if you do it this way, it's going to make my life harder because I already have this open source project that does this or whatever. So having the ability to kind of um, guide it a little bit is great. Um, but just having that too, I think just gives a little bit of credibility to when you are sharing information. So you say, look, I, you know, I'm talking to PMs. I'm, um, 
I'm part of this, right? So I don't work for AWS, but at the same time, I'm so much invested in what it is that they're doing and how that applies to the work that I'm trying to do uh, and the things that I'm trying to accomplish, that having that, you know, that's a little bit of extra credibility, I think that's super important to have. Um, and that's one of the things I love about, you know, this global outreach that, um, you know, Rebecca, you were doing and, and clearly, Farrah, you're doing now to try to get more people that deserve that extra bit of credibility, that they really deserve that because they're doing amazing things and giving those people that um, just that extra boost so that you can get past that conversation of, well, I don't know anything about this person. Well, you know what? AWS thoroughly vetted them. Rebecca reviewed their code and everything <laughs> is good. Um, and, you know, and that just gives you that extra sense of credibility. And I think that is hugely important, especially when people are trying to progress in their careers um, and break through all these different ceilings. Definitely. That? No, that was good. That was awesome. I, I'm actually, I'm glad to hear the connections part because I do feel like that is such an important piece and, you know, trying to figure out, you know, ways to continue to do that, you know, as 22, 2022 goes along. Uh, and especially now that we can start getting together in person. Yes. Uh, and I imagine we're going to start running into each other at different events uh, across the globe. Um, so. I look forward to it. That's actually. Speaking, yeah. speaking of connections, um, how can listeners connect with you? So we'll certainly put all these details in the show notes, but if you want to say it out loud and people can type it while they walk. Oh, okay. It's uh, at C 32 on Twitter, and I'm just Farrah Campbell on LinkedIn. Um, and I think those are the best places probably to find me. Um, cool. or, at and, an um, or, or at an AWS event coming near you. <laughs> yes. Yes, and I will. Um, I will definitely see you, uh, Farah, at Service in the Park for the Reactathon thing. I think I saw that you will be there. Um, I will so be. I will be there doing a, a roundtable discussion with uh, Mateus Billman, uh, the uh, the CEO of um, Netlify, and Brian Larue, and somebody else that I can't remember. But I will be there, so that should be exciting. I will be at Service Days New York in June. I don't know if you have any plans to be there, but. Um, but anyways, I uh, I look forward to bumping into you. In the park, this is going to be very interesting. I'm very excited to see what this conference is going to be like in a park. I've never I've never done one outside before, so this will be right. uh, the the first time. Um, yeah, exciting stuff. Well, like Rebecca said, we'll get your contact stuff into the show notes, um, and then you know some information about the uh, the community builders program as well, so people can uh, find out more about that. But thank you very much, Farah. This was great. Um, and I can't wait to have you on for the Four Timers Club. Four yeah. Timers Club, the one Next and month. only. See you Next there. month? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, we'll see. We'll see what happens. All right. Thanks again. And that's this week's serverless chat. Rebecca and I want to give a huge thank you to Farrah Campbell for being our guest this week and to our sponsor, Lamigo. If you want to check out the show notes and a full transcript of this episode, you can find them at serverlesschats.com slash 134. For more serverless chat, subscribe, sign up to be an insider, check us out on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can connect with Rebecca on Twitter, at Becca Odele, and me, at Jeremy underscore Daily. And if you want to keep up to date on everything serverless, make sure you subscribe to the Off by None newsletter at offbynone.io. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to chatting with all of you again next week.